morning. Bit of a rush this morning getting here and uh, oh. <laughs> is this thing on? Yeah, okay. Um, thanks, Sam. Um, yeah, we're in a bit of a rush this morning with one thing or another, so sorry for the late start this morning. I don't see any visitors here, so uh, good to see those of you who are here. Uh, today's worship, I'll be presiding and uh, Michael will bring the reading uh, from Revelation 7. David has the Lord's table and Simeon will bring us a lesson. Mike and Susan are on refreshments today. Um, if you haven't already done so, please silence all your mobile devices. But also remember there are other things that can be disturbing, like flicking of pages. Uh, so please be careful with the songbooks and other items that you may have for reading. Remember that the cry room is there if your child needs settled, but it's not a playroom because it's not soundproofed. So if you go back there with the children, it's to try and quiet them down, please. Uh, if you can't get into the cry room because it's already occupied, there's also the ladies' room at the back uh, to try and settle any children that may be upset. Or any adults that may be upset for that matter. Um, rest of the announcements will come at the end. come together this morning to worship God and to remember our, our Lord and Saviour and what he's done for us and giving his life for us on the cross and all glory should be given both to our God and Saviour. So our first song this morning is Thine is the Glory, number 673. After we've sung this, uh, we'll remain standing for an opening prayer. Shall we stand together and sing? Thine is the glory.
thankful for this opportunity we have to come together as your people to give you praise and give you the glory. We thank you for what you've done for us in Christ, that you've loved us so much that you would send him to be the saviour that we needed, that he would live a life that was completely obedient to you, and that he would show us the way back to you. And by giving his life on the cross, he would make it possible for us to be your children. We thank you for our time together as we sing praises to you, as we hear your word. Help us to leave this place renewed and refreshed and ready to face the challenges of the world ahead. And we pray for the world around us, Father, that's struggling with various things that go on in various places. We ask you to be with those who would make decisions, that they would make wise ones, that they would help to restore the peacefulness of the that we've known recently instead of the anxiety and suppression that seems to be going on just now in oppression. We pray, Father, for those who are still to name you as Saviour, those who struggle with the, the, the concept that you exist. Show them, Father. Show them, open their eyes that they may see. Because we know that all around us is evidence of your existence. And within us, we know that you have put a place to turn the that we might seek you. So as we offer our you our worship, we pray you will accept it, that we will offer you, offer you worship in spirit and truth. We pray all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The next song I've selected is 495, which is the first song that Simeon uh, was teaching us a few months back now. And uh, I did try and leave this the last time I picked it, but it's been such a long time that I struggled to remember how it starts. So I'm going to ask Simeon to, to read that one for us. Just there. 495. <coughs> Very 
driven. Yes, and it's very cold. So today's reading will be taken from Revelation 7. And I'm reading from the NIV version. Revelation 7. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the air to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Nathalai, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where do they come from? I answered, Sir, you know, and he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb by the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Amen. The next song is number 515, which I think fits in well with what we've just read and speaks of our hope of being there one day to stand before God in his throne room and see it in all its glory. So number 515, after this I'm going to invite David up to lead us around the table. Shall we stand together? On Zion's glorious summit stood the universal street, by blood they hid their king in strength, divine. I heard the song and strove to join.
Three days. The Bible speaks a lot about three days or the third day, and many mentions of this. A search produced lots of verses that mention three days or the third day. Uh, but my focus would be what our Lord Jesus Christ said, and we all of us know that He was raised on the third day. come around the Lord's table, remember his death, but we also remember how he was raised again. Now Paul in his letter to the Corinthians talks about the gospel. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15 it says, how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So it was the scriptures that, uh, that saw foreshadowed that Christ would, would be raised after three days. It wasn't a random number. It was, all, it was all spoken of before in the scriptures. So there, there's a lot of symbolism behind this. It being the third day, it was all foreshadowed. I won't, I won't go into that too, too deeply because uh, we want to focus on Lord Jesus Christ here. So in, in the Gospels alone, the Lord Jesus Christ talks about his death, and on many occasions he alludes to his raising up on the third day. Matthew 12, 14 says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. John 2, verse 19, Jesus said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And in Mark 8, 31, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. So our Lord Jesus Christ predicts his death, uh, his resurrection rather, after three days on many occasions and it did come through. He rose victorious on the third day. His disciples, however, they were surprised when, or weren't ex expecting it, in a sense. For, for his disciples, they heard the Lord Jesus Christ say these things throughout his ministry, and why did they not see that he would be in the grave for such a short period of time? Three days, he wasn't in the grave forever, and he's not in the grave anymore. And we see uh, Doubting Thomas, as he's called in 
and in Sunday school we called him Doubting Thomas. After the disciples that told him that our Lord Jesus Christ was alive, he still continued to doubt. John 20 verse 25 this is what Thomas said, Except I sh shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And further down in that same chapter, we see how the Lord Jesus Christ appeared. And Thomas touched the nail print and thrust his hand into our Lord's side, and he then believed. And what our Lord Jesus Christ says after that is probably one, one of a, a very encouraging verse to us. It should be especially. John 20, verse 29. It says, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Brothers and sisters, that's us. We are blessed. We haven't seen our Lord Jesus Christ. We haven't thrust our hand into his side. We haven't touched his nail prints, but we believe. And blessed are we because we believe. And how do we know that our Lord Jesus Christ lives? He lives within our hearts as the hymn goes. So with this in mind, and we remember what our Lord Jesus Christ did for us, on the cross. He died for our sins and he was raised on the third day. May we remember him by taking this bread and this wine. Shall we pray? Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can come together again on this first day of another week. And as we remember our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ and for what he did for us on the cross, for his body that was broken and bruised, we know that you raised him on the third day and he lives forever in the glory. And as we take this, this bread, we thank you for, for this. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. God and Father, we now look towards the cup that represents the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross. For without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission for sins. And it is this, this blood that we put our trust and put our faith in, and by which we are saved. We are washed in the precious blood of the Lamb. And our sins, though they may be as scarlet, they are white as snow. And we do this now and ask your blessing. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Before Simeon brings us the lesson, uh, we'll sing the song of the month that he's teaching us, 821. And uh, as you're going to be speaking from the front, you may as well come up and leave it from here, Simeon, and I won't let you do that.
this tune. Oh, the blessed rock of ages, trusting that the Lord in thee, keep me till my journey's end, till thy blessed face I see. Hide me, O blessed rock of ages, till thy blessed share with us um, a lesson I first heard sometime in 2017 um, from a brother back in my congregation. It has a very funny title. And when this brother first came up with this title, I sat beside his wife that day in church. And she was like, I wonder where my husband gets all these titles from. <laughs> the title is, It Happens to Frogs and men. Frogs, F-R-O-G-S, and men. Now there's a story that says, I don't know if it's true, but it could be true. If you catch a frog and you put the frog in a boiling water, the frog will jump out immediately. That's because the frog naturally reacts to a sudden change in its environment. But if you catch that same frog and put it in a cold water, gradually light up or increase the heat in that water, the frog would adjust itself to the temperature of the water until it dies in the water. Now you might think the frog is foolish, but are humans actually different from the frog when it comes to this. In the book of Hosea chapter 7 verse 8 says, Ephraim has mixed, Ephraim has mixed himself amongst the people. Ephraim is a cake unturned. Helians have devoured its strength, but he does not know it. Yes, gray hairs are here and there on them, yet he does not know it. And the pride of Israel testifies to its face, but they do not turn, but they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all it, for all this. Now the children of Israel had mingled closely with other nations to the point where they were doomed to suffer disaster. From that passage, we can see that they were slowly swallowed up 
by those around them. Their wealth was taken away by taxes. Their morality had destroyed their lifestyle and their worship to God had been contaminated by false gods made from idols. It did not just happen suddenly. It was a gradual lifestyle that became a common place without the children of Israel even realizing how far they had drifted away from God. The children of Israel were gradually drained from their spiritual strength because of the constant influence with the things around them. It was a gradual change from their lifestyle with God to the lifestyle of the world. And it is that gradual change I want us to consider today. With a sudden change, it would be easy for you to identify <clears throat> that you are decaying spiritually. But when it is gradual, just like with the case of the frog, it is difficult for you to actually identify that you are drifting away. And that's drifting can lead to destruction at the end of the day. There's a saying that says that when you do something continuously, it becomes an habit. And as that habit continues, it becomes a character. Now I want us to look at certain ways we can drift away gradually without even realizing that we are drifting away from God. First, many times we are quick to judging people without even realizing that we are part of those things that we judge people about. Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 to 5, Jesus said, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged also. And with what measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eyes, but do not consider the plank in your own eyes? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eyes, and look, the plank is in your own eyes? Hypocrites, first remove the plank from your own eyes, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eyes. All Jesus is trying to tell us here is this, that before you begin to judge other people, be sure that you are not into such sin or any sin at all. We must have come around across some people who are worse of in terms of character, but they are quick to judging other people. They are quick to passing judgment on others without even passing judgment on themselves first. And the same can happen to us as Christians today. Sometimes the love we have for ourselves or because of our self-conceit, we cannot see the huge plank in our own eyes as Jesus described it earlier. And a great example we can look at is the story of David, Uriah and Bathsheba. Of course, we know what David did after he committed adultery with Bathsheba and got her pregnant. He sent Uriah um, to sleep with his wife. And after he refused, he sent him to the, battle, to the front of the battlefield to be killed. And there he was killed. And let's see what happened in 2 Samuel chapter 12, from verse 1 to 6. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. And he came to him and said to him, there were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own head to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took from the poor man's lamp and prepared it for the man who had come to him. 
So David, so David's hunger grew greatly against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, this man who has done this shall surely die, and he shall restore fourfold for the lamb, because he did this, and because he had no pity. Here we see Dave, uh, Nathan was telling David a story about a rich man and a poor man. And just as Nathan finished telling the story, David became very angry and passed an instant judgment on the rich man, saying that he deserves to die because he showed no pity on the poor man. Now let's see from verse 7 to 12 what happened next. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. And thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hands of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping, and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if this, and if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you dispersed the commandments of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriel, the Hittite, with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall not depart from your house, because you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriel, the Hittite, to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversities amongst you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did, it in, you did it secretly, but I will do these things before all Israel, before the sun. This is a great example of how a person cannot see the plank in his own eyes sometimes. David didn't have any problem passing judgment on the rich man because he was quick to identify the fault of the rich man. But he failed to identify his own fault. And it can be very easy for us as Christians to fall into this kind of trap where we would not see our own fault, but rather we see the fault of others and pass instant judgment on them. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not know yourself that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. And as Christians, we need to test our behaviors and actions against the word of God. If we see that we have a big plank in our own eyes, then we need to repent and pray to God for forgiveness and try our best not to allow sin back into our life. Another way we can decay spiritually or drift away is by gradually backsliding from the Lord. Now, let me use this example to illustrate this. We have men here with gray hairs. If you wake up in the morning and then suddenly you went to bed with dark brown hairs and then you woke up in the morning, suddenly your hairs have turned white, you would, you would know quickly that something is wrong. But if you wake up and then you see one strand of hair somewhere is gray, you can't really tell if that is the first gray hair you had. Because there could be one at the back of your hair. There could be one in the middle. So it's just a gradual step you grow these gray hairs. Also, growing up, if you pick your picture 10 years ago or 20 years ago, and you show it to your grandkid. Your grandkid might not believe you are the one. That's because over time, you have grown from who you were 10 or 20 years ago into you who you have become today. And so it is the same thing with Christians. People who have left the church or who have been backsliding did not just wake up one morning and decided to stay away from the church. It starts with one excuse. Oh, today I don't feel like going to church. Let me just stay back. Next week I will go. And then next week, oh, 
I have one small headache. How far we can go? And it continues like that and like that and like that with one excuse or the other. And then gradually you are drifting away without even realizing it. As time passes on, you gradually start drifting away. And you might even say, oh, I don't need to go to church on a Sunday morning to worship God. I can stay in my house and pray to God. We often hear people say this. And then, that thing which you have been doing gradually turns into a habit for you. And then that habit, as it continues to pacify, it becomes a character. And then you see no reason at the end of the day why you should even worship. Because you feel, I can stay in my house and pray to God, and God will answer my prayer. And that way, I am still worshiping God. But as long as God continues to answer my prayers, that means he's still with me, and so I don't need to worship with the saints. The saying is very true. That habits or consistent thing we do becomes an habit and habits becomes a character. And so we should examine ourselves and try to notice the gradual, gradual changes that we are making in our lives. Let us not forget that the scripture also says that we should not forsake the gathering of the saints together. <coughs> and so are you starting to miss church because you don't feel that they are important anymore? If you are, then you could be very well on your way to gradually drifting away from the side of God. And the fact that he continues to answer your prayer or grants you all those things you ask for does not mean he is with you. It only shows that he's giving you more opportunities to turn away from that habit and come back to him. Another thing a person can do to decay spiritually without realizing it, is to have too much interest in other things. <coughs> you have a very lovely TV program you like to watch. It airs by 5 p.m. on Sunday, and then suddenly it changes to 11.30 a.m. And you decide, oh, I just can't miss this program. Let me just stay back and watch it. I'll watch the live recording, or watch the recording of the worship much later. You allow that program to take the place of God in your life. It now becomes so important to you and you become so attached to it that you feel that it is not necessary anymore to worship because the program now airs at 11.30 a.m. when the worship starts. It starts gradually. You worship this Sunday Oh, next Sunday, I'll watch my program. And then the upper Sunday, you come, and then you miss one Sunday, the next Sunday, gradually, and then you begin to drift away. When it begins to take so much of your time, and you feel that you can relegate God to the background of your life, then there is a problem somewhere. We have to make sure and watch the activities that we get involved in. If we see that they are causing us to miss church service or causing us to be too tired to study God's word and pray, then we need to stop that activity and find some way to modify it so that it doesn't come between us and God. Sometimes I ask myself, if I stay home today and then Somebody calls me and tells me, come and do a two hours job and make 200 pounds. The excuse I have given to stay away from worship, will I use that same excuse not to go and make that 200 pounds in two hours? Back when I was in school, I, during my undergraduate days, back home, it's always very funny, the way lecturers fix their programs for students. I think it was in my first year and um, we had to have a logic test, um, continuous assessment test. 
and the lecturer fixed the first for 10 a.m. on a Sunday. I told my colleagues I will not come. And they were like, the man is serious. I said, yeah, I know, but I will not come. I'd rather I will go to church. And then at 10 a.m., I was in church, up to 12.30 when we finished. And I called my colleague when we finished. Have the man come? And he said, no. I said, yeah, I'm coming for the test. And then at 12.30, I went to the lecture hall. The man arrived at 1 o'clock. And I told them, I just know I have to follow my mind. Because over the years, I've learned something. If I'm supposed to be in church, this is just personal to me. It might not work for every other person. If I'm supposed to be in church and I leave worship to do something else, it doesn't work out for me. I once was preparing for a very critical exam. It was supposed to be on Monday at 8 a.m. And I decided I would not go to church. I would go and read. I spent from 8 a.m. till 12 a.m. reading. And I did not learn anything. And at that period, I was supposed to be in church. So I wasted four hours of my time doing absolutely nothing. On other occasions, I've decided to travel on a Sunday and almost got involved in an accident. This is just to me. It might not work for every other person, but this is what I've learned about myself. That when I can control my time to be in worship, then I should be and not relegate God to the background. And so we must always remember what Jesus said in Matthew 6 33 seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all other things shall be added unto you. And if your priorities are not right, it will be very easy to allow your job or your hobby or what you like very well to lead you astray. And so it is very important that as Christians, we set our priorities very right so that they do not drift us away from God. And finally, another way we can drift away gradually into error. We, thought we, we, we can drift away into error as, an, as a congregation without even realizing that we are drifting away. Now, how does this work? In an organization, when you want to effect a change in an organization, if you do it suddenly, it would not work. Now, during my master's that just finished, my project was on, um, I did a project on the NHS, and I looked at a project that they carried out sometime around um, 2012, between 2010 and 2012. And it was a project, it was supposed to be a change project to introduce IT systems into the NHS. And that project failed. And at the end of the project, it cost the UK government 10 billion pounds. So 10 billion pounds was wasted on a project that never succeeded. And the reason why that project never succeeded was because of the rush in implementing that project. And so, as a congregation, if you want to drift away, or when, change, when drifting wants to occur in the congregation, it doesn't just come suddenly. The change agents in the church, in quotes, would look for the weak links within the church and begin to indoctrinate them with their own gospel. I'll give another example. I learned music in 2008 as a student, or while I was in school with the congregation I worshipped. I was part of a, an a cappella group in school, and in that 2008, we launched our first, our second album as of then, which was my first with the group. And we invited people to come for the launching. We invited a preacher of one of the congregations. And when he was about to make his own launching to, the, um, to us, he said, and I quote, it's time that the church begin to look at introducing some small piece of instrument into their worship. Today, this congregation doesn't use instruments, but they are far away.
from what the church is. It's so bad that it got to the point where the churches of Christ around him decided that he should change the name of the congregation. They shouldn't be called the Church of Christ anymore because of their way of worship. And so it starts that way. From small piece, you introduce another small piece. And gradually, that small piece becomes a big issue within the church. So when change agents come into the church, they don't just come and make the change sudden. They make, it, they make it gradual because they know that if they make it sudden, everyone would know about the change. So they make it bit by bit, ensure that they have enough people who have accepted their own doctrine. Romans 16 verse 17 says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. For those who as such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. Paul wants the churches to watch out for those who cause division, but also not to describe this change agent. But also notice he describes this change agent as false teachers having smooth words and flattering speech which deceives the simple. With that in mind, let's think like change agents for a mi minute and see if we can come up with a possible way we could sway the majority. And so if you think like a change agent, you will see that because you know how strong the church is, or because you know how strong some key members in the church is, you would not want to go close to the key members who are strong. You would look for the weak links within the church. And so it is very important that as Christians, we do not make ourselves the weak links in the church. And how do we avoid this? By continuously studying the word of God and to make ourselves equipped and prepared for the battle ahead. If we study our Bibles, we will be able to recognize when change agents comes into our midst and that way we can put them away. Brethren, don't fool yourselves by thinking that you are strong enough and you cannot fall. Because it could happen to anyone at any given time because we lack that ability to watch. In conclusion, Remember that the spiritual decay happens slowly and sometimes it happens without us knowing. So we must ensure that we examine ourselves continuously and watch out for the changes that occur in our lives daily. But we must also remember that if little changes can happen to frogs, it can also happen to men today. I remember the first time, well, not the first time I went to the barber, but when I was in, sitting in the barber and the first time I saw grey hairs fall, I went, whose head's he cut? <laughs> it's uh, surprising. You look in the mirror, and then the next day you look in the mirror again, and something's changed, and you begin to wonder what's going on. But uh, a good reminder that uh, we need to be on guard. But we can look forward to a day when we will all get to heaven. So while we're doing that, let's sing the wondrous love of Jesus. And remember that each day so that we can keep <coughs> faithful in our lives as we march forward with Christ. So we stand together and sing and then remain standing for concluding prayer. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing it.
Simeon today that we need to be on our guard each day to ensure that we are in your word knowing what you want of us and how we should live and knowing how then we can live each day with the challenges that we face to secure ourselves in the knowledge that we are walking safely by your side we thank you father for that reminder and for the the joyous scenes of the, the, the reading we had in Revelation of the, the, the worship that was taking place in heaven. And uh, we pray, Father, that we can be a part of that someday. And we know it will be a, a, an eternal glory that we will uh, be there before you to see you in all your glory. We pray, Father, for the work that the church does here, the, the examples that the, each member sets. We pray that we can always be putting Jesus first in our lives that he might be seen to be living in us. We ask you to forgive us when we do fall short because we know we still do. Strengthen us and keep us safe, Father, and guide us as we negotiate the, the perils of living in the world today. We thank you for all your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just the final announcements. <coughs> Next Sunday, Robert will be presiding. Uh, I'll be reading from Revelation chapter 8. Simeon has the Lord's table and Emmanuel will bring us the lesson. Uh, cleaning this week goes to Michael. It's either Adam and I or Joy that's on coffees next week, so we'll sort that out between our, our, ourselves. I, I know we swapped with Joy, but I can't remember when we swapped with Joy, so we'll work that out and we'll figure out who's doing that. Um, if you are interested in the devotional nights, uh, Kirkcaldy is hosting the next devotional evening on Saturday the 17th of February from 7pm. We have the joint meetings coming up the 1st and 3rd of March, 7.30 on the Friday and Saturday and Daniel will be speaking here on the Sunday the 3rd of March. There is a fellowship buffet planned for that day and uh, there's a, a list here if you can add your name if you're are intending on being here so we can arrange the proper uh, numbers uh, for catering so print your name and uh, member or visitor identify yourself that way uh, whether you're an adult or a child in the child's age if you've got that and whether you have any allergies if you can um, there's a small box so hopefully you don't have too many allergies but if you can mark on it there the, the any analogies you may have, this will be on the notice board, and do that as soon as possible so that uh, arrangements can be made. Like you wanted it by next Sunday. Well, hopefully. Yeah. We'll give at least a couple of caterers a couple of days. Yeah. So hopefully, if you don't do it today, do it by next Sunday. If you don't put your name down, you ain't getting fed. <laughs> Other events coming up, uh, the Young Men of God event at Cumbernauld on the 17th and 18th of March, 7pm each evening. That's an event that's open to all, it's Young Men of God that will be speaking on that occasion. Um, Mark speaks on the Sunday night, um, there's, there's two speakers per night so they're not particularly long lessons I don't think uh, each evening. 
Also, there's the social in Kirkcaldy on the 11th of May from 1.30, and names are needed for that as soon as possible because they are restricted on the numbers they can host. So please add your names to that. There are other events coming up as well, but they're a bit further away, so we can leave them out just now that they don't need specific requirements for. So uh, I think that's all the announcements, unless someone else has got anything they need announced. And that's fine. Let's have some fellowship.